after a great lunch, you usually want to take a nap. So I advise you do it right away, uh, because uh, after about 20 minutes of slides, I plan to have a puzzle, a quiz, sorry, with seven or eight questions. So make sure your Wi-Fi is working so you can join with your phone and, and vote. We'll see who knows the most uh, about Scala compilation at the end. So there's an interactive part at the end. Uh, so yeah, uh, plan, plan to be uh, competitive and awake in 20 minutes from now. Um, all right, so about myself, I'm um, part of the original Scala team. I joined uh, Martin's lab when Scala 2.0 was, uh, was barely sort of announced. Um, after that, I worked for five years at Lightband. I was one of the initial members of the team there. And about a year and a half, I founded my own company, Triple Quote, where we do a parallel Scala compiler. So naturally, my interest and my background is in compilers, especially Scala ones. And how can we make them faster? Um, in this talk, though, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some, uh, some things that are maybe less known, but still interesting uh, when you use the Scala compiler every day. So the number one thing, which is obvious, um, is that when we talk about a compilation time, often we mean build time. Uh, and the difference is quite stark. Uh, Scala C is indeed slower than Java, but uh, our whole tool chain when you start building a project, adds to that. So before you even start to compile your project, if you're using SBT, there's a bunch of things that will happen. So uh, there's dependency resolution. There is source generator. Some projects actually have a formatter that run through, runs through all of your code and reformats it, uh, and settings evaluation. And even there, you see uh, a nice warning, which says search state exploded around line 177. Um, it's not immediately clear what file that was, but um, uh, that probably indicates that formatting was slow around that line, or, or that's certainly not a good thing if it's, if it's a warning. So let's say that finally uh, we did all those things. Um, SBT will still need to find out what needs to compile. Uh, it will be very thorough, so it will probably uh, look at the class path, read all the files from disk, and hash them to make sure that it didn't change since the last time you compiled. Um, it also stores um, dependency information. It's called analysis, uh, which can get pretty large. So um, for example, in a, in a project about, I don't know, let's say uh, 50,000 lines of code, this analysis data can be um, several megabytes. So it, it may sound little, but if you do this every time you compile, even for a single file, it may add up. Um, now that SBT decides to compile a number of files. Um, it needs to collect dependency information from those files, and that takes uh, about 50% uh, of, of the total compilation time. So there's an overhead there. Um, usually, we find this trade-off um, good because next time we might compile less files. So, so we live with that. Uh, however, for the CI, this may not be always needed. So if you're just doing full builds, clean builds every time, then you could get your compilation 15% faster by, by not uh, doing zinc, with some caveats. Um, so if you're not doing CI builds, you're probably using an IDE and you're developing iteratively. So you're making some small changes and rebuilding. So you could skip all of those steps um, and use the IDE to build, or, or Bloop, which is a newer command line tool that can do a similar uh, thing. Basically, just compile. You assume nothing has changed in your jars, in your class path, and uh, you do not need to reformat your code just because you made a small change and you want to um, uh, run your tests, for example. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, I noticed, it happens quite often, um, is that type classes and macro derivation are a killer combination. So it's a killer combination because it saves you a lot of typing. Uh, you can, and I think that 80% of the cases where you use type classes and macro derivation is for serializers. You want, you want a JSON serializer for your case classes. Um, so it saves you a lot of typing and boilerplate, but at the same time, um, this adds to your compilation time. So um, a few things, though, because you may not realize um, that every time you generate a JSON serializer, you generate code that the compiler will later, ha later have to translate all the way to bytecode on disk. So it's not only the cost of running the macro. 
everything that comes afterwards still needs to happen on those trees and those ASDs that were generated for you. And if you're not careful, you might actually generate a lot of them. Um, uh, and and th there's actually a puzzler ca coming later on, um, I think. Yeah, OK. So if I take this example, um, and we're just going to use, I think, Cersei der auto derivation, I have two case classes, which is a typical example of my, uh, let's say, uh, almost every application will end up having something like this. Um, a, a, a smaller case class, full name, that gets nested into a larger one as a field. Um, and what I'm doing later on, I want to use these JSON serializers that are generated automatically for me by macros. Um, so to simplify the code, I just wrote implicitly. But each one of these calls will generate a JSON serializer. So um, quick question, how many uh, serializers will I have for uh, shipping address? One or two? Two, two different classes. And for full name, uh, uh, even more. So I don't show you the generated code. I'm just showing you the code size. So after type checking, if I comment both lines, um, and if I print out the, the source code, it will be eight kilobytes, which is fine. It's not a lot of code. And there's also some imports in there that I didn't show you. If I uncomment one, that goes uh, to almost four times the size. And if I uncomment the second one, it explodes uh, almost uh, another two times. So um, this is the type of um, cost that you get by, not, by, by using type classes and macro derivation. The, the elegant solution here would be to use a companion object on both case classes and put the serializer in there, and then make sure uh, you always import that guy so that it's picked up. So it's not regenerated at every use site. You might have probably tens or maybe even hundreds of places in your code where you need a serializer for a case class. You don't want to regenerate it each time. Um, speaking of macros, um, do you know what's the difference between a white box and a black box macro? Just raise your hand if you know. All right. Uh, I would say half of the people know. That's great. So. Um, do black box macros participate in uh, overloading resolution? The answer is no. So the difference between a white box and a black box macro is that um, a white box can um, generate a type that is more specific than what you had in the source beforehand. So that means if, you're, uh, if your macro generates a serializer for um, uh, your case class, the return type will not be just JSON serializer or JSON codec of uh, shipping address, it may be something even more, sp more specific, like an anonymous class. So why is that important? Well, since you get a more precise type, you want to use it later on, which means you might use it to decide what overload method to call. So um, this is a snippet from the Scala compiler. And you can see that uh, on the white box side, so if the macro is not black box, Type checking is repeated three times. There are three tries that happen. And they're in sequence. They are not an if then else. So a white box macro will take longer to type check. A prime example of, uh, of such macros is shapeless. And shapeless, I think, is the foundation of a lot of uh, other libraries uh, that, that use macros. Now, since we talk a lot about Scala compilation, where is the time spent? And uh, I would say um, a third of the time should be spent in the type checking phase. Um, and that's, that's the nice case. Of course, it's not always the case. So um, if it's above 30%, which is uh, relatively easy to find out, you probably have some part of your code uh, that is doing either a macro, either recomputing macros too often, uh, or, or some very convoluted inferred type or a very convoluted um, uh, implicit that it has to search a lot for it. So Scala C has a flag called minus verbose. Uh, it would print how long it takes every, in, in every phase of compilation. So you will find out how much is spent in typer. So in a, in a purely functional programming uh, paradigm, it should still be around 30%. Uh, however, I've seen projects where this was 80%. Uh, so 80% of the time was just type checking, and that was due to um, the, the, the macro derivation and type classes bomb. Um, so what are the culprits? Well, macro expansion I already mentioned, implicit resolution as well, but there are a few Scala features 
uh, that we do not think of them as being macros, but they are implemented behind the, the scenes uh, using macros. So those are uh, quasi quotes, uh, type tags, and um, actually formatted string interpolation, not just plain string interpolation. The one where you can actually put formatting modifiers for printing in hex or padding with zeros and so on. Uh, these are macros in these guys. So quasi quotes can actually slow down compilation quite a bit. Um, that's, of course, not used very often, but if your own library or your own project um, defines its own macros, very likely you'll be using this feature. So um, one other thing that I found, I found useful when I was reasoning about build times and compilation times was to find out how much code is generated uh, at the typer phase. So uh, we start with a relatively small program, as I showed you, a couple of case classes, and we end up uh, with something that is a lot larger. So uh, I don't know, maybe 10 times larger. Um, so the question is, how does the size of your program change uh, through compilation uh, phases? And the size cannot be lines of code at that point, because once you start uh, compiling, you have another representation. It's the AST, so syntax tree. Uh, what we can do is count the nodes. So um, would you expect that nodes after the typer phase are more or less than what you started with? More. Um, indeed, they are usually more, but it, it can also be less uh, in certain cases. Um, and I'll let you guess uh, what those are. Um, but generally, type checking adds nodes, and the more nodes you have, the more time uh, you need to compile. A typical value of this, uh, of this factor, um, the multiplier, is uh, 1.2, so roughly 20% more AST nodes. Um, but it can vary wildly. So I've seen projects with 5x, and surprisingly, it wasn't always uh, just uh, type classes and macros. One, uh, one feature that adds a lot is pattern matching. So if, you're, if you were here at uh, Krzysztof's um, talk about bytecode and performance, pattern matching showed up as a relatively slow um, uh, construct in Scala. Uh, it was surprisingly, it's also a little bit slow to compile um, pattern matching. All right, so uh, cases where this number goes below one, uh, you have less nodes is when you have uh, very, very empty uh, classes, let's say. Uh, so, so just interfaces with method definitions, because what the compiler does, it replaces type signatures with uh, a single type node with some symbols in it. So it sort of simplifies your ASD. It makes it more abstract. Um, and uh, the number six, I said only five, but I have a bonus one, is that the Scala compiler is single-threaded. So. Uh, this may be surprising you know, in a certain way because we live in, a, in, a, in the age of multi-core computers, but there are good reasons. So uh, first of all, Scala was designed 15 years ago. Uh, it's a batch compiler, so it starts with a very simple model of reading sources, applying phase after phase, parsing, type checking, uh, lowering all sorts of encodings, and generating code. Um, the nature of the Scala language uh, requires a certain degree of laziness. So laziness comes into play when you have uh, recursive definitions. Re recursive simply means loops in your definitions. You can have a method that calls itself. You can have a class that refers to itself. A linked list, for instance, uh, has a field which is next, and it's a, the same type as the enclosing class. All of these cycles have to be broken somehow, and that is solved through laziness. Um, at the same time, uh, for performance reasons, because uh, the Scala team was always trying to make Scala faster, um, mutability is a part of the, the, the compiler, let's say, um, architecture. So mutability and caching uh, are in there, so making this parallel is actually quite hard. The other message is that if we have more powerful machines, it will not make our Scala builds faster. Um, and I have under my desk in my office a computer, an, an Intel Core i7 from 2012. It compiles uh, ACA actors, so a relatively small Scala project, but still about 10 seconds, exactly the same time as my uh, MacBook Pro, which is um, uh, one year old. That's because it's single-threaded. 
Um, so unless we have a parallel Scala compiler, we cannot hope to really make a big uh, a dent in Scala compilation times. Of course, there are different approaches, but what I'm interested in is uh, compilation techniques. Um, so there is one that works today. That's the one that I, my company is working on. It's called Hydra, the multi-headed monster. Um, and I'm not going to talk about how we do things uh, uh, there uh, t today. There are other talks where I explained a bit more. So just to get a feeling, though, for how fast is Scala C in the single-threaded case, uh, I put some numbers together. So um, it's, it varies quite a lot with the project. So I took some uh, typical, let's say, coding styles. Uh, these are not benchmark numbers. These are on a warm Scala compiler, uh, but I didn't run JMH. I rounded the numbers, but they're actually pretty stable. So these are ballpark numbers. Uh, Spark, if you've ever used it or you, if you looked at the source code, it is generally a better Java. So they use pattern matching, they use lambdas, but they do not use uh, macros extensively, and they're actually fairly restricted in the type of Scala code they write. So um, using 2.12.4, uh, they compile about 1,200 lines of code a second. Uh, if you take uh, something that is very functional, pure, pure FP, pure functional programming, like the CATS library, that's a little bit below 500 lines of code, so a factor of more, more than two times slower. A play framework, um, here I took Lee Chess. If you know the, um, the application, it's a pretty old uh, Scala open source project for playing chess. Um, on average, they pull a little bit more than Spark, so 1,500 line, 1500 lines of code a second. And uh, with an interesting uh, twist, though, so views, these are these HTML templates where you can intersperse uh, Scala code. Those compile quite a bit faster, so around 2,000 lines of code a second. And controllers, which are your logic, where you have actually quite uh, a bit more um, framework around you, uh, though, those go down to 500 lines of code. Uh, this was with 2.11, so probably this could go a little bit faster if, uh, if Lee Chess upgraded to 2.12. All right. So um, at this point, uh, I'd like to switch to, uh, to the little quiz that I have prepared and see if you guys want to play. So let's see. I've never done this on stage before, so I will uh, simply uh, take a leap of faith and hope that everything works fine. So... Um, there is no inter... Ah, perfect. Um, let's see. I have 21 minutes left, so uh, in the meantime, you can all go to the website called kahoot.it, and my password should be... All right. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Um, start. So um, you just go to kahoot.it. Do you see? Can you see the um, the URL? You should join and type in the game pin, which is written there. Let's see. If anyone manages to join, we'll see the, the players appearing. Excellent. Oh, wow. Huh. Okay, so now we can see we have 44 players. I think there's a limit, uh, about 80 or something. We'll see. Forty-nine players. Wow, for fifty-one. Okay, I, I'm gonna wait a bit more. All right, 57, that's it, 58, 59. <laughs> Amazing. 
I think this is testimony to the quality of the Wi-Fi in this uh, this conference. <laughs> Seventy. <laughs> All right. Seventy-one. Let's let's see. Let's uh, let's give it another five seconds. If anyone else joins. All right. Oh, somebody left. <laughs> Seventy-one again. Let's start. Seventy-two. Oh God. Um, let's go um, and. Here it goes. Let's see if I do full screen. Do I miss anything? Can you still see everything? All right. So the first quest question is warm up. Just write the answer. By the way, you get more points uh, if you answer quicker. So the, the time you spend thinking is deducted from your points. <laughs> All right, probably, yeah, I guess uh, a few people played the joke. All right. Um, Let's go. So our next question is for real points. Um, we, okay, we see this, the, the scoreboard, and we go. How many instances of decoder a full name are generated in this code? So you have 60 seconds. It's a full name, the smaller case class. All right, so it seems we have 72 answers, but there's still a bunch of uh, uh, like 19 seconds left. I wonder if we were we were more than 72 now, or if the website is not that advanced to, <laughs> to stop. All right, two, one, cool. So um, a lot of people said only two. Um, and I don't think I can go back to the code to show it to you. Uh, the, the, there are four of them because we have two instances of the outer case class, shipping address, and then inside the shipping address there are, again, two full names, the, the, the build to and the ship to addresses, so to say. So um, the, the, the JSON serializer will be generated in each position where this is needed. So it's actually four times. And if you remember from the slides, uh, the code size was growing. Um, um, it was doubling every time. So yes. Uh, I was using Cersei, so I guess it was using Shapeless. No, I'm not guessing. I'm sure it's, uh, it's Shapeless behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go next question. So we have um, Qs as the top scorer. What was the most important new feature in Scala 2.9.0? New collections, parallel collections, XML literals, or triple quotes? Come on, guys, three more seconds. All right, so indeed, parallel collections. Most people did, uh, did have the right answer. Uh, new collections library uh, was introduced in 2.8, so the, the major release just before 2.9. Um, XML literals were there from the very beginning, uh, and I hope to be able to prove it a bit uh, further down in the, in the quiz. Uh, and thank you for the 12 votes for triple quotes. Scoreboard, Jacob is on top now. Uh, how many lines of code per second does Scala C compile in a typical project? So by typical, I included also a snippet of uh, <laughs> such a code. So 1,200, 3,000, 5,000, or 300 lines of code a second. You cannot be wrong, really, with this one. <laughs> All 
All right, so let's see. Yes, so you were not actually taking the nap I suggested in the beginning, you, you, you remember it from. Um, all right, so the next question is obviously, how many lines of code does Scala compile in a typical pure FP project? And bonus points if you recognize where this code is coming from. not from parallel collections, no? All right, uh, yeah, the, the answer, most people got the right answer and the code was from cats. Shane, bravo, next. Um, which ones of the following Scala features are implemented as macros? And here there's more than one, one answer that's correct. Uh, I'm afraid uh, I didn't find a way to have a, you know, multiple answer that you can give. So pick your favorite. So uh, answer one is string interpolation, uh, type tags, formatted string interpolation, and quasi quotes. And there's at least one that is not a macro. We're stuck at 69 answers, come on. Three more or four. <laughs> All right, so um, the only one that's not implemented as a macro is string interpolation. So that was the trick question. A string interpolation by itself is not a macro formatted string interpolation. The F, um, the F um, uh, interpolator is a macro. Type tags, they are implemented as a macro because uh, essentially when you want to have the representation of a type at runtime, the compiler itself provides you a um, more or less an AST representation of that type and, and puts it into your program. So it's really a macro. And the same for quasi quotes. When you write uh, an interpolator and inside you have a Scala expression that has to be translated into an AST tree that gets plugged into your program. It's the same principle in, the, in both cases. Now, an interesting thing is that these guys, even though they are macros, they're intrinsics in the sense that the compiler shortcuts them. So if you have them in your code, uh, it, will, uh, it will be a little bit faster because it's in the same class loader as the compiler and it, it has some special casing for them. Let's see. Uh, Shane, well done. Seventh question, what implicit is selected and what does this program print? So um, here there are essentially two, com two competing implicits that you can use on the last line in the example in object main. So the question is which one gets selected in this code? Or it doesn't compile, of course. So the, the implicit inside object utils, it's a bit more complex. It's an indirect one. You have to compose two things to get the, the result, while the one in the companion object, it's also, it's directly providing you the value. That's, that's why there are two implicits up there. All right, so uh, from import, that's correct. Uh, though the majority believe that the one from the companion will be selected. Um, the answer is imports take precedence, and that's the escape hatch you have if you're using a library which 
forces upon you a bunch of implicits in their companion objects, you can always override that with an import. So imports are the absolute uh, highest priority. If you have them in scope, that's the first step the compiler does. Can I get an implicit without any prefix? So it's directly in scope. That's the one. Um, the one in the companion, uh, in this case, even though it's simpler, it's directly the value I need, uh, it's not going to be selected uh, for, for these precedence rules. Uh, and this is, a, this is an important case, because if you're using shapeless and autoderivation, you might think that the companion object will take precedence. But if you happen to have an import at the top of your file uh, with an implicit that could construct potentially in many steps an implicit value for, uh, for what you need, it will take that, that route. Um, and it doesn't compile. I believe some people thought the implicit, uh, import utils dot underscore that comes before the object is defined is not allowed. It is allowed. You can do that. All right. Now, now it's the last question. So Shane still on top. Piotr coming strong. Um, when was Scala first publicly announced? When, what date it was? So January 20, 2004. July 1st, 2006. September 1st, 2020, so we have technology from the future, or January 23, 1996. And this is the official announcement from uh, Complang um, uh, Functional. Back, back in the era when people used uh, NNTP and Newsgroup and Usenet. Perfect. Most people got it right. So. Um, it was in uh, January 20, 2004, and 1996, that's actually Java 1.0. All right, let's see who won. Um, Shane, congratulations. Let's give him a round of applause. 9,704 9, points. So all the people on the th first three places got all questions uh, right, eight out of eight. Uh, the difference was made by the speed with which they uh, tapped on, the, on their phones. Uh, fantastic, great. I should add some harder questions next time. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to end with, um, of course, my employer's uh, slide. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the conference and you enjoy the quiz and my talk.